that was easy. I pulled muscles trying to sing that. I'm going have to I'm go into traction. My goodness. Just when you can't sing and you hear something like that, that's pretty, pretty powerful. Some of you have heard this, this term. This is going to wrap up our Dulo series that we started on five, six weeks ago, whatever it was. And I want to thank Dr. Lewis and Pastor Goldworthy preaching when I was gone. I was able to watch some of the services on my iPhone, one of driving down Interstate 65. There I was. And I saw the back of Alton's head. And some of the back of your, so your heads look great from the back, I promise you that. And um, I wasn't driving. I was just in the car. But I was going to play um, golf on a Sunday. It doesn't happen to my life very often, doesn't it? But that's what I was doing. Um, Romans chapter 6. You've heard this term before. It's a slang um, expression. Who's your daddy? You ever hear that? Who's your daddy? Uh, it's been around forever. I looked it up in the Urban Dictionary. I'll define it for you in a little bit. But I remember I, I related to a baseball story because I remember back in, I think it was 2003, maybe 2004, 2003, I think it was, Pedro Martinez, who just was inducted to the Hall of Fame, uh, as a Red Sox, he, he was beaten by the New York Yankees, a tragic day in all of our lives. And, um, and, and, he, um, and he said, I guess today the Yankees were my daddy. That's what he said. Well, the New York press grabbed all over that. So the next time he went to um, um, Yankee Stadium and was playing the Yankees later on in the season, the whole chant was throughout the Yankee Stadium, who's your daddy? Who's your, it went on for nine innings. Who's your daddy? So that thing has seared my heart. That is, it's, it wounds me just in hearing that. It's a, a slain expression that, uh, again, is defined as a rhetorical question, is commonly used as a boastful claim of dominance over the intended listener. That's what it means. In other words, it can be said, who controls you? Whose authority are you under? Who's your daddy? Who dominates you? And I think it's a question that we need to ask ourselves first in the spiritual realm, um, the emotional realm, and even the psychological realm. Who does control us? Whose authority am I under? I'm going to define that a little bit more for you as we go ahead. But I want to read some verses to you because the Apostle Paul asked this question in his own way 2,000 years ago. And we're talking about this word doulos. It's a slave's life. That's the Greek word for slave or servant, as it's translated many times. But slave is a better translation. Let me read these verses. You'll see what I mean. Well, then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can become a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from this, your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of your weakness, of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves to be slaves to impurity and lawlessness which led to even deeper sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You were now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom, but now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in life eternal, eternal life. Now I'm going to go back and define that and comment on that passage for you in a little bit and pull out of there what we want to pull out of there. But right now I want to just do a revisit to the very first week in this series, about five or six weeks ago, whenever it was, and look at this word slave or the Greek word doulos in, that you find in your Greek Bible. Um, it means to be a servanthood points, I'm, let me put it this way. The most likely best translation, and some of you in your Bibles, depending on what translation you have, may have it, is the word bondservant. It's an old word, it's an archaic word, we don't really use it in our English anymore. But a bondservant sells himself into slavery to another. I would sell myself into slavery to you, I'd become your bondservant. Very strong word. 
Very powerful word. When you say that we're, when that passage says we're slaves to sin, it says we are bond servants to sin. Or slaves to God, we're bond servants to God. It's, it's not a um, voluntary thing. It's, it, it's a picture of ownership. Kittle, who's this one of the Greek guys that um, um, defined this, I'm going to use a couple of the definitions. One who has totally lost their freedom, talking about doulos, one who has totally lost their freedom and is controlled and dominated by another. That's what it means. Colin Brown, another guy that writes about this stuff, says a, a, a slave owes his master exclusive and absolute authority. He owes his master that. Zodiades, actually one of my Bible college teachers for an intensified course I had one time, defines it this way. A permanent relation of servitude to another with his will altogether consumed by the will of another. Dulos, slavery. So Paul's bringing up here in Romans 6 that we're slaves to sin. What does he mean by that? Well, first of all, I think we need to define sin. Because if you don't really know what that means, you immediately think we're slaves of doing something really bad. Um, and that could mean that. Um, and you might be thinking of individual sins that you, that you commit or that you've struggled with. And, and, things, and, that, and that could fit, too. There's no doubt that could fit, too. But I'm, I take sin much broader here. When usually when you see sin in the plural, sins, it refers to individual acts of sins. But when you see it singular, it, reveals, it really points to the whole prevailing nature of sin and what that means. And I take this term and I put a pretty broad umbrella around it because I put underneath sin um, the, the flesh, what the Bible will call the flesh, or man's attempt to meet his own God-given needs through his own strength, however that works for each and every one of us. So sin is the prevailing nature of every man Without Christ. Now, when God breathed life into us in creation, in the garden, he, he made us humans. He didn't make us robots. He made us humans. He put in me love and the deep need for significance, the deep need for acceptance, the, the need for safety, um, the need for affirmation, um, security, and throw a few more of those needs in there if you'd like. And he, put, he made us humans. That, that makes us human. We do need to be loved. We do need to be affirmed. We do need to be safe. We do need to feel a sense of significance. Um, those are, that makes us real. Nothing wrong with those things. But in, in, when we were created, God made us those things for him to meet those needs. He was our significance. He was our dependence. He was our security. He was our affirmation. He was our love. He was all that we needed him to be. He was to us prior to sin coming into the human race. Then sin did enter the human race. We know the story, the apple incident. And, and our relationship with God was severed. But that didn't mean we stopped being human. And that didn't mean we stopped having those needs, but now they weren't met through him. So we did this. We looked horizontal. Imagine that. Adam and Eve, perfect, absolutely perfect relationship. No flesh involved, no needs involved. They're getting along great. Then all of a sudden, God wasn't meeting those needs. So Adam looked at Eve and Eve looked at Adam. And the next person created was a marriage counselor. <laughs> Because that was, um, that, that was trouble right from the beginning. Because what, in a sense, what was being said here is Adam saying, Eve, you need to be my love now. You need to be my affirmation. You need to be my acceptance. You need to be my safety. You need to be my significance. You need to be my security. You, you are responsible for meeting my needs now. And that didn't work. Because Adam couldn't meet Eve's deepest needs. And Eve couldn't meet Adam's deepest needs. Because they were created to have those needs met through Christ, through God, and only God. Not that there wasn't a level of human needs that humans can meet, because we can. But we'll always come up short. So we, without Christ, my friends, we become slaves to these things. Because I'm going to get that need of acceptance met. Or I'm going to look, and I'm going to look, and I'm going to look, and I'm going to look, till I find somebody to accept me. 
I may compromise my own values, my own priorities, till I find somebody to accept me, till I find somebody to affirm me, till I find my place of significance. That might be more money. That might be a, 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 a position of prestige. That may be a human relationship. That may be in a big family, whatever it is. Give me my significance on a human level. And we pursue it. I related the story of a friend of mine that oh, we're going back probably 30 years now, but, was, but throughout our relationship with my friend, he's a pretty wealthy individual. And I remember back in the 80s telling me, as soon as I make my, this much money, I'm good. I just want to have this much in savings, and I'm good. I don't have to worry about this anymore. And, and he was a hard worker and pretty bright guy. He made that much money um, pretty quickly. So within the next five to ten years, he said, you know what? I think I just need this much more money. Then I'll, be, I'll feel secure and I'll feel fine, economically safe. Well, again, he, he got there pretty quickly. And so he goes, I think I just need a little bit more. <laughs> this went on for about 30 years. And so now he's a wealthy man, and I don't think he's really pursuing it anymore, but it, the bar kept raising a little bit. Make me feel secure. Put my security someplace, economic security, and I'll take care of that myself. It was the pursuit of these things. See, these things dictate our relationships. These needs dictate our actions, our decisions. They can control our inner life, our outer life. If I had to say, if you say, you know, Pastor Kelly, in the 30 years of ministry, what is the number one mistake that you see people make? Or at least what realm is that made in? I could say unequivocally, relationships. Number one mistake I see make people make, relationships. Why is that? Because of these needs. Find somebody to affirm me. Find somebody to accept me. Find somebody I can belong to. I just don't want to be alone. I don't want to be isolated, whatever it is. So I'll compromise with somebody of a different value, different priority system. I, I won't bide my time. I won't wait. I must find and get these needs met. So I, in a sense, sell myself out to them. We become slaves. They become our daddy. Mm -hmm. Who's your daddy? <laughs> Some of you not chanting with me. <laughs> now, David Paulson, I read a bunch of books when I was gone. One of them was a book he wrote called Seeing with New Eyes. Chapter 7 of that book is a really good chapter. He, um, he uses 25 what he calls x-ray questions. I'm not going to have 25 for, for you, but let me define what he defines as an x-ray question. These questions aim to help people identify the ungodly masters that occupy positions of authority in their hearts. These questions reveal functional gods, what and who actually controls their particular actions, thoughts, emotions, attitudes, memories, and anticipations. So these are the questions, questions sort of peer through us, x-ray questions. You can see what's behind the, what's really behind it. Some of us will never think at this level. Some of us will never respond at this level. Some of us don't like to think at this level. I was sharing in the first service, um, some of the most corrective moments of my life it consistently is the quiet time I spend with the Lord in the morning. If I'm aggravated about something, God doesn't show me or verify my being aggravated. He shows me why I'm aggravated. There's a tension in my marriage. He shows me why there's a tension there. And it's never, ever anyone else's fault, <laughs> which I'm a little discouraged about. He just shows me things about me all the time. And I find every pr pr uh, proposed problem I have out there is really my problem. It's something I'm not relinquishing. It's something I'm holding on to. It's something I'm trying to manipulate life on. It's my problem. It's something I won't give up. I won't humble myself before, potentially, whatever that is. Here are some of these um, x-ray questions. I only have seven out of 25. I won't take long. Where do you find refuge, safety, comfort, escape, pleasure, and security? That's one question. I'll say it again because I went quick. Where do you find refuge, safety, comfort, escape, pleasure, and security? Answer that question honestly to yourself. It'll be an x-ray to you. Where do you bank your hopes? Question number two. Truly. 
Is it in a relationship? Is it in a government? Is it in my, my checkbook, my financial reserves? Where do you bank your hopes? Question number three, what do you seek, aim for, and pursue? What are your goals and expectations? That's all one question. Again, this is grabbing just seven out of the 25 questions that Polison had. Here's a big one. Where do you find your identity? How do you define who you are? How do you see yourself? I am a housewife, mother, businessman, preacher, whatever it is. How do you define yourself? And if that's the case, and once you determine that, what does that mean? In other words, if I don't go, do good at this or I fail at part of it, I'm a businessman, but I don't succeed in business, so does that change your identity? X-ray questions. What do you pray for? Whoa, that's a big one. That one got me. Because my prayer life starts with me and sometimes ends with me. And that's okay, because we cast our cares on Jesus, 1 Peter 5, 7. But if my prayer life never elevates out of my own world and never sees the kingdom at hand and the bigger things that are facing us as God's people, what do we pray for? X-ray question number six, what do we see as your rights? What do you feel entitled to? Wow. Well, Ever feel like you get the raw end of the deal? I like this all the time. I battle with this one. God, I have the white hat on. They had the black hat on. How come they seem to be winning this battle? How come, how come the, your, people are affirming those people when they did what they did to me? How come my friends are liking them? I don't want anyone to like them because what they did to me. And my friends like them. That's not right. I'm entitled to this, right? Haven't I been faithful? Boy, that's a trap. X-ray questions. Last question. On your deathbed, what would you sum up your life as worthwhile? What has given you meaning? On your deathbed, how will you summarize your life? X-ray questions. These questions and others are a peek behind the curtain of what it really drives our engine. They can give us an indication of what we are slaves to or, as we said in the sake of the message, who's our daddy? When we answer some of those questions and others and have a really stark view, a look in the mirror to see who we really are, we can find out what controls us, what dominates us, Who's our, who, are, who is our master? Who's our daddy? So that says we can be a slave to sin, those things that want to dominate us, or we can be a slave to God. Or what in this passage, you can't separate being a slave to God, or it appears two or three times, from this word obey. I want to look at that word for a little bit, because we have a tendency to have a harsh austerity to that word. But the word obey, hupokoe, really means that you listen, you hear. You hear what God's saying. It means you subordinate yourself to what God is saying. The root word for this, this Greek word means that if somebody, if you're a butler or a porter, your job is to answer the door. Someone rings the doorbell, ding dong, and you open, that's your job, you open the door. Yes. That's your job. If I didn't answer the door, I'd be fired because that's my job. So that's, in a sense, the, the connotation of what it means um, to obey. The obedient person is listening to what God has said and is saying with the intent to obey it. Now, the first place that we know he's going to speak to us is through this. That's the first place. This is the easy place. And I have to say this. I'm, I'm, I'm more objective than a subjective guy. I don't like the subjective things. I see so many people calling things from God, which is really not from God, but from themselves. They make it up. Their little old minds make it up sometimes. So I'm a little bit nervous about ever doing that myself. But, it's, um, but in, in my life, when God has spoken to me the greatest, it's always been with the word of God wrapped around it. 
recently, three and a half years ago, three years ago or so, I guess, when we lost our daughter, and, um, and I was seeking fervently for God to speak to me. And then I was asking questions about why and why this happened, why he let it happen. Those, those answers never came. But he spoke to me very clearly about what he wanted from me. And he did it through the word of God, Hebrews 10, 35, and 36. Hebrews 12, 1. Isaiah 57, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. He spoke to me. He gave me direction, courage in some ways, and strength. But every time it was attached to the word of God. So the first thing that we see is we have the word of God. And it's easy to see that and read that. If we don't read it, then we don't know what's in it. But it tells us how to live. It tells us how to have a family. It tells us our value system, priority system. It tells us how to be husbands and wives and children and how to manage our money and what to eat, what not. It really tells us everything we need to know about life. So the slave of God, the first thing he does is submit himself to God and wants to and devise to obey that. Now, then, then there's a subjective aspect of that, too. In other words, when God speaks to me. God may lead certain people to do certain things that not necessarily in the scriptures, but he may direct people in a certain direction and, um, and to respond to that and to obey that. I know when I had my confrontation with the Lord back three and a half years ago, I, I, I was faced with a decision. I could obey what the Lord showed me to do or I could retreat. My inclination because of the, my own personal devastation was to retreat. So you're faced with that decision of hearing God knocking at the door. Let me just say a little bit more about this and I'll move on. Um, be ready to hear. When you open the scriptures, um, be ready to hear. Be ready to listen. Be ready to hear what the Lord may want to speak to you. Encourage you, convict you, challenge you, inspire you. Whatever it is for you that given day or that given moment of your life, be ready to hear. Number two, show up to hear. If I, don't, if, I, if I never open it, it can't speak to me. If I don't give myself over to reading it and learning it and, and, and letting it um, invade my life, invade my mind, then I can never probably grab what the wisdom I need to grab out of it. I never will. So give yourselves over to it. You don't have to become a preacher, but you open up opportunity for God to speak to you. having, being a slave to God, a doulos to God, would create a new value system. We talked with Pastor Burns a little bit before church about this. The, the things important to God becomes important to us. His desires become my desires, or at least they're on my radar screen. The kingdom of God becomes on my radar screen. If the kingdom of God is never on my radar screen, maybe just, it's just business or it's just um, this over here or, or a, a hobby or, or whatever it is, but the kingdom of God and the things of God never come on my radar screen, then there's something amiss, spiritually speaking, in my heart. I'm a slave to something. I'm not a slave to God, but I'm a slave to something else. You have to figure out what that is, but I'm not a slave to God. I'm a slave to something else. Something else has dominance over me, controls me, runs my life, dictates my life, dictates its values to me. I think it's just normal, but the scripture is saying it's coming under being a slave to sin. That's what the scriptures are saying. God not only becomes our value system, he becomes our source. He becomes our go-to destination when life happens, when we hurt. I'm not against going to other human beings because we will, I will, and you will. God gave us each other in the body of Christ. But very honestly, though, we might do ourselves well by going to God first. Start there and work your way out. <laughs> you may bring people into your life. We start there, and he becomes my source. I may be loved and comforted and accepted by people and my friends, and that's just as much God as anything else. But when life happens, he wants, I want him to be my go-to place. Now, I'll say this, and I'm going to get on the last point, and we'll close and go into dedicating babies. This doesn't mean you're not human, and you become a, a scripture-quoting machine. You know. God, as I said earlier, made us human. 
stuff happens in life. Some of it's devastating. And people face things, and people have problems that we don't have problems with. It. How come he has a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. How come he, that person struggles with that? I don't know why they just get to stop it. That's what they got to do. Because, and we, and we have this little, almost a cocky, legalistic, authoritative type of thing, and we become this, just be very careful that it's okay to be human. I've been whapped up the side of the head so many times with this thing. People, and not with the actual Bible, say, you know, this, all things work together for good. But, oh, what was that? A bruise from a King James. Uh, and, 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 and we're human beings. We hurt. We feel. We struggle. We battle. We lose those battles. We get up. We dust ourselves off. We move on because of the grace of God. We get up again. We fall again. We get up again. We fall again. We get up again. We lose some more battles. We win some battles. We lose some battles. It's called life. The key is we're in the battle. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the race. I know I'm in the race. And sometimes I run really well. Sometimes I stagger. Sometimes I limp. Sometimes I run on my stubs. But we stay in the race. And we know, we know that at some point this race will end and it'll be worth running it. It doesn't mean, we, again, we become this scripture-quoting robot. I know I'm weak, wounded, and sometimes very wimpy. <laughs> but I also know where my ultimate answer is. <clears throat> now, with this said, I'm going to close with this. Because what I've left you with so far here is, um, God is good, you are bad, try harder. <laughs> it's not where we want to be. I mean, because God doesn't leave us to our own devices on this. He empowers us to live this life. He gives us a life to live this life. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Um, 1, 1 John 3, 9 says this. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Well, for God's seed abides in him. That word seed is the Greek word sperma, where we get the English word sperm, God's life, God's seed, he cannot keep on, he cannot keep on sinning, sinning because he has been born, a brand new life, born again, if you want to use that term, 3.3 3 of John, born of God. 1 John 5.4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So there's this mystery of redemption. When we become born again, we're born again with a new life. This life doesn't share power with the old life. This life supplants the power of the old life. Let me show you what I mean. Romans 8, um, 1 and 2. I don't have these verses for you. Uh, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 of Romans 8. For the law of the spirit of life, that's the new life. The law of the spirit of life, watch this, has set you free from the law, sorry, in, in Jesus Christ, from the law of sin and death. Sorry, where are my glasses? So this, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So that's saying that we're under the law of sin and death, then I meet Christ. And his new seed, his new life comes in me. So now the law, the gut, and that, let me slow myself down. That word law there can be translated different ways, no moss. But that in this particular verses and, and other places in Romans, it means you could translate a governing principle. The governing principle of sin and death has been supplanted by the governing principle of life. So, so, yes, I, I was a mess. Yes, I am depraved. Yes, I, do. I am a slave unto sin. But now I have a new life inside of me. Now I have a new person, a new entity inside of me. And I'm no longer subject to the dictates of my old man. I have all the authority and all the ability to gain victory in every area, my friends, of my life. The Christian in the, mis in the mystery of redemption... We're born again of a new life, and it's available to anyone. Let me read you a quote by Dodson, and we'll close in a few moments. Paul's thundering negative is followed by gospel logic. He's commenting on this Romans passage. If we have died to sin with Christ and received his new life, we've died to sin, singular, the whole prevailing nature of sin, with Christ, and received his new life, then as new men, sin will bother us to the point of repentance. That's what sin will do. It will bring us to a point where we say, God, I don't want this. 
For disciples, sin is a theological absurdity. New men don't live like old men, hobbling around on canes when they can be running marathons. So who's your daddy? Who's, who's your daddy? Who, who are you going to give dominion to your life to? Whose control will you be under? Whose dominance will dominate you? God's best will always be better than our attempts to find meaning outside of him. He goes, I want to be your daddy. Be a slave to God, as Paul said in Romans chapter 6. Be my slave. Come under my dominion. Because my burden is easy and my yoke is light. So being a slave to me will not be difficult. It will be transformational. Being a slave to me will not be burdensome. It will be life-giving. It will not make you heavy-hearted. It will make you light-hearted. Being a slave to me, God says, will not um, take meaning out of your life. It will put meaning in your life. Being a slave to me won't rob you of anything. It's just going to impart more to you. Because I love my slaves. And I'm for my slaves. And just as I'm the master and you're the slave, I'm the dad and you're my child. And I love you, and I'm for you, and I'm behind you, and I want to give you the very, very best that, God, that I have for you. And my friends, that isn't what sin has. That's not the best. That's make-believe. That's the world's best. That's the devil's best. That's not the best. God says, I want to give you the best that I have. It won't be what you think it is. It won't be what comes natural to you sometimes. But I promise you, if you'll just hear what I have to say, and, and, and come under my covering, listen to what I have to say, obey and come under my covering, I'll give you a quality of life that you could get no other place. Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for these precious people here. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you are here today, I've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior in the quiet place of your heart. Salvation doesn't happen by accident. Um, salvation is an event. It takes place once in a lifetime. And it takes place when we simply ask. We ask. Jesus died on the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should never perish but have everlasting life. That's a verse that's quoted everywhere, but it really contains the gospel in itself. For God so loved the world. That's why he died, that he gave his son to die that whosoever 30 plus years ago, I was a whosoever. I was one of the people that believed. Maybe today is your time, your day to be a whosoever. Whosoever believed on him, Jesus, and what he did on the cross, die and pay for our sins, should never perish, but have everlasting life. In your own way, your own words, between you and God, say the simple prayer after me. Again, your own way, your own words. Jesus, I don't understand everything, but I do know that if salvation and the free gift of eternal life is mine, then um, by asking, then I'm asking for it. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Come into my life and save me. If you said that prayer and you meant it in your hearts, my friends, then you're born again. Please let somebody know on the way out the door, a friend, a family member, an usher. And Father, we pray today uh, these x-ray questions. Show me, Tim Kelly, what's going on in my own heart. Show me areas of deception. Show me areas of selfishness. Show me areas of woundedness, which I may attribute to something else. God, I want to be willing to hear and obey whatever it is that you show me. Bless this message to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll do the baby, baby dedication after the song. Okay. <laughs>